Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Eunsil Gang. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Riceville United Methodist Church. It is my great joy to welcome you to our worship service at the Vine on online campus of Riceville United Methodist Church. We are truly grateful to worship together. No matter where you are joining us from, we cherish your presence with us today. So we believe that God will encounter you through today's worship service. So now let us prepare our hearts before God. Take a deep breath and feel closer to our Lord. Please join me in our opening congregational prayer. The words will be shown on your screen. Holy and loving God, you have created us, redeemed us, and called us to be co-workers in your mission. Jesus, deepen our discipleship so that we can make disciples of all nations. Holy Spirit, Transform us so that we can take part in the transformation of the world. In Jesus' name, Amen.
Let us go before God in prayer. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, thank you for calling us as your children. Thank you for bringing us together as a community of faith. As we gather here today, we ask for your presence to be felt among us. Open our hearts and minds to receive your word and let it guide us in all that we do. May our worship be pleasing to you and may it bring us closer to you. Lord, we lift up our church and all the ministries we are involved in. We pray especially for our upcoming vacation Bible school this week. Bless all the preparations, the volunteers, and the children who will attend. May VBS be a time of joy, learning, and spiritual growth. We pray that the seeds planted during VBS will grow and bear fruit in the lives of the children and their families. Lord, we also lift up to you the needs of our church community. Just as the early believers worked together to ensure that everyone was cared for, we to strive to help and support one another. May we be filled with your spirit and wisdom as we serve each other, ensuring that no one feels left out or forgotten. Lord, we pray for our community, our country, and the world around us. We ask for your peace and comfort for those who are hurting, lonely, or in need. Especially now, we pray for those whom we name with our voices or hold in our heart. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We trust your goodness and your plan for us. We humbly offer this prayer in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now take a moment to offer our heart and gift. As we respond to God's grace and generosity, you can contribute to the ministry of Ricefield United Methodist Church by mail or through our website. Let us continue to worship our God. I'm Pastor Eun Seo. How are you today? I'm so excited to share this time with y'all. So today I have a bag here with some papers and each paper has something written on it that shows a way we can help others. So I'm gonna pull out these papers and read what is written on that. Um, okay, here, it's the first one. Set the table for dinner, right? We can set the table for dinner helping our parents, right? And the other one is, okay, here. Open the door for others. Yes, right, we can open the doors for others. Mm -hmm. And, oh, here's the last one. What's that? Share my toys or snacks with friends, right? We can share our toys or snacks with our friends, right? I love all these ideas to help others. Just like we read these ideas, today we're gonna hear a very similar story from the Bible. So in the early days of the church, all the believers were like a one big family. 
They shared everything they had and took care of each other. But as the church grew, some people started to feel left out, especially those who didn't speak the same language as everyone else. They were not getting enough food, and absolutely, this made them very sad. So the apostles, who were the leaders of the church, wanted to make sure everyone was treated fairly. But they were very busy teaching about Jesus. So they decided to choose seven helpers to make sure everyone got the food they needed. So the apostles prayed for these seven helpers and laid their hands for them, which was a way of showing that these seven helpers were special people chosen by God. And these seven helpers did their jobs very well, so the apostles could focus on teaching about Jesus. And soon, everyone was very happy again because no one was left out. So more and more people gather and gather, the church grew and grew. You know, sometimes it is really hard for one person to do everything on their own. And that is the reason why it is so important to help each other. So just like today's story, we can also be helpers for each other and make sure no one feels left out. So Ricefield Kids, this week, let us practice at least one way to help others. Okay, great. Let us ask um, God for wisdom through our prayer. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us and teaching us for how to love others. Help us to share your love with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Doug Lane. I'm senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. And I want to thank you for taking time to worship with us here on The Vine, our online campus here at Wrightsville. Throughout the summer, we're going to be looking at the book of Acts. And we're going to see what we might learn from the early church. Today, we're in chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Now, during those days when the disciples were increasing in number... The Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And the twelve called together the whole community of the disciples and said, It's not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this task, while we for our part will devote ourselves to prayer and to serving the word. What they said pleased the whole community. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, together with Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. They had these men stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. The word of God continued to spread. The number of the disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. This, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you call us to different tasks within the church. Lord, I pray that um, you will make plain what you need each of us to do. And Lord, that you will open our ears, our hearts, and our minds to the calling that you place on us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it didn't last long, not really. The disciples' first attempt at communal living, selling everything they had, bringing it together for distribution so that everyone had enough and no one needed to claim anything as their own. Just two chapters later, here we are, the Hellenists, that is the Greek Christians, complaining because their widows aren't getting as much aid as the Jewish Christian widows. Maybe it was greed, or maybe it was ignorance. Or perhaps just plain racial prejudice on the part of the Jewish Christians. Then again, maybe it was grabbing and clawing on the part of the Greek Christians. Maybe a simple neglect on the part of the apostles. 
And maybe it's just a faulty method of distribution. I mean, how many times has the church set out with good intentions, but the plan just didn't work out as we imagined? Whatever it was. It wouldn't be the last time that the church would have to deal with the tension between ethnic groups or between the haves and the have-nots, between the ways of effectively meeting needs and trying to figure out an effective strategy to meet everyone's needs. It also wouldn't be the last time that the church would have to deal with the deeper issues of the balance between word and work either, between piety and charity, between sacrament and service. So the apostles moved to restructure their ministry, to balance the role between the ministry of preaching and the ministry of compassion, to find the balance between soul work and servanthood. And in order to do it, they chose Stephen and Philip, along with five others, to focus on the ministry of food, the ministry of serving, the work of compassion. They did it not to pit one against the other, suggesting that one ministry might be more important than the other, but instead to model a balanced ministry, the whole ministry of the whole church in proclaiming the gospel and doing the gospel. Now, to be fair, it's easy to see why the first disciples would continue to focus on the evangelistic role, right? This is, after all, the first proclamation of the faith, the very first preaching of the good news. They had to get the word out to rally the people before they could do much of anything about serving widows and feeding the hungry. It's easy to understand why the preaching ministry would take place first. After all, Jesus' last command to the disciples was to go and preach the word to all nations, to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And besides, look at the results. Peter preached and 3,000 responded. Luke says the church was adding daily to those who were being saved. People were responding to the good news. Meanwhile, they were also attracting attention because of their compassionate service. The apostles were healing people, giving sight to the blind, helping people to walk again. It seems the whole city was abuzz about the signs and wonders being done by the early apostles. But behind the scenes, back in the upper room, there among the gathered community of faith, there were people who had joined the church who also needed help. And if the church was going to model this new life in Christ, it had to live out piety and charity in the world and inside the church. How are they going to do it all? How will they handle the preaching of the word and the work of ministry, the witness to Christ and the compassion of Christ, the concern for the soul and the care for the body, the work of the people to order the life of the church and the work of the people to serve in the life of the church. How would they find time to be both sacramental and sacrificial? We still struggle with these things today. It seems the church is always getting caught between the two, depending on your theology, drifting to one extreme or the other from evangelism and preaching the word and saving souls on the one hand, and the passion for social issues, healing and justice ministries on the other, favoring Peter's preaching or Stephen's serving, all the while trying to find the right balance to get the fullness of ministry that Christ really intended for his church. I've heard people say to me over the years that the only thing the church should do is preach the word and save souls. Meanwhile, I've heard others say that the church is completely irrelevant if it does not meet the needs of its people in the community. So which is it? Well, last Sunday, I went back home to High Point. I honestly can't remember the last time I sat in the pew with my mom in my home church. It's been a long, long time, maybe 28 years or so, ever since I became a pastor. I really can't remember. But when I was a kid growing up in High Point, it seemed that my church was very focused on teaching me all the right beliefs. I went to worship every Sunday and to Sunday school, to Wednesday night dinners. I sang in the children's choir, and when I got old enough, I joined the youth group. Faithful attendance to these things was very important for my family. Now, maybe I was too young to understand, but I don't recall ever talking about 
the implications of the gospel on race relations in the United States or on the Cold War with the Soviet Union. I heard that the United Methodist Church had missionaries in Africa, but I don't ever res remember discussing colonialism or apartheid. Live Aid, that series of concerts designed to help feed people in famine-stricken Ethiopia, occurred when I was 14. I sang along to Do They Know It's Christmas After All and We Are the World. But sending food, money, or supplies to Africa didn't seem to be the kind of business that my church or any church that I knew of was going to get involved in. Closer to home, no one ever talked about making sure that all Americans had a living wage or access to affordable health care or having diversity in the workplace or how to address the flow of immigration or whether or not the justice system might show a bias for or against certain groups. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. These things may have been discussed, but not the church. No one I knew ever went on a mission trip to a faraway land. We weren't invited to volunteer at the local homeless shelter, and we never ever sang, Here I am, Lord, is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. What we did sing was amazing grace. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. And anything made popular by Billy Graham crusade. I love that church. It's the church that formed me. And it did a good job of what it was trying to do. But unfortunately, as the issues of the world continue to press in all around us, many people found that that kind of church was lacking, and they left it. In fact, millions of Americans have left churches just like that. Now, fortunately, the story of my home church is a story of a great comeback, but we'll get to that in a minute. Because before the comeback, I went off to college, and there I learned about things that I really had only skimmed the surface of before. I came to understand that the civil rights movement was rooted in the gospel and in a church experience that was simply different from mine. I came to learn that the peace movement was also rooted in the gospel and another church experience that was very different from mine. But I didn't learn about these things in church. I simply learned that they were born in the church. And since I was learning about them outside the church, there was never a mention of having a relationship with Christ or the acknowledgement of the need for God's grace. But I could see the connection. Since I'd been faithful to attend Sunday school, vacation Bible school, Sunday worship, Wednesday night choir practice, Sunday night youth group, well, you know, some of that Bible stuff actually sunk in. And I could see how someone could read the Bible and study the life of Christ and reach the conclusions that these other churches were reaching and teaching that were different from what I learned growing up. And I suddenly realized I needed both. I needed grace and compassion. I needed repentance and rehabilitation. I needed sacrament and service. I needed to love God and love my neighbor. There's a popular meme that floats around on social media <clears throat> that says, what if I told you that the left wing and the right wing belong to the same bird? That's what I needed a church that could embrace both parts of the gospel. It was neat going back to my home church last week. Some of you know I went back because the church was dedicating a wall in their clothing closet in memory of my dad's years of volunteer service at the church. That's right, the church has a clothing closet now. And dad led church members on more than 55 mission trips through Appalachian Service Project. The church serves dinners at a homeless shelter twice a month, and they give birthday gifts to kids at a high-poverty school that they've adopted. Guess what? The church is growing by leaps and bounds. We might even say it's flying because it has nurtured both the left wing and the right wing of the bird. Now, we do a lot of those same programs that I just named and actually much more right here at Wrightsville. I hope our ministry initiatives, our church life and programs, Lift up the balance between Peter and Stephen, between worship and work, between sacrament and service. Let me give you a few examples. You may not know this, but yesterday one of our church members, Dick Morrison, was consecrated at the North Carolina Annual Conference to be a certified lay minister. 
He's done a lot of work in the last year to learn more about Methodist theology, history, polity, and preaching so that he can be certified to lead worship services in churches and senior living facilities. He'll be spreading the gospel throughout Wilmington and beyond, and I'm so excited for how he's responding to God's call on his life. Meanwhile, this Sunday at each worship service, we're consecrating two youth mission teams who will go out in our name to serve the poor and needy. Our senior highs are going to El Salvador to help build a Methodist school there. Our middle schoolers are going to Lake Norman to help people right here in our own state. And tomorrow, we'll start Vacation Bible School here at Wrightsville. We have 250 kids coming and over 100 volunteers. We'll be engaged in evangelism and spiritual formation. But these kids will also be involved in outreach as they collect money and stuff backpacks with supplies for kids through family promise and communities and schools. I could go on and on about how we teach young people in Sunday school and then reach more kids by volunteering in the public schools. We give our money to ministries in the church and we also give our money to community ministries like Mother Hubbard's Cupboard in the name of the church. We come to worship and sing God's praise and then we leave to witness by how we behave. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement in the 1700s, called Methodism the via media, the middle way, bringing a balance between the personal gospel and the social gospel, between grace and holiness, between science and faith, between piety and politics, between work and worship, between sacrament and servanthood. You see, we're not an either or kind of church. We're a both and kind of church. And honestly, that's what I like about it. We don't just share half the gospel. We try to present the whole gospel for the head and the heart, for the body and the soul, for this life and the life to come. But that brings me to a question. What about you? I'm going to ask that you take a spiritual checkup today. I want you to take a minute and look at the cross. It should appear on your screen. And if you're having trouble, I want you to look at this cross right here on um, the red pyramid. For our purposes today, I'd like to suggest that each beam in the cross represents something. The vertical beam that goes from the bottom to the top is the beam that represents our relationship with God. Where would you say you are on the beam? Is your relationship really strong right now? Are you involved in healthy spiritual practices like prayer? weekly worship, Bible study, and tithing to the church? Would you say you're closer to the top of the beam or closer to the bottom? Or maybe somewhere right in the middle. This is the piety beam. Where do you stand? What about the other beam, the one that goes across, the horizontal one? This is the charity beam. It represents how well we share our love with our neighbors as ourselves. Are you generous or stingy? Are you forgiving or begrudging? Do you share your time and talents or do you keep them to yourself? How are your relationships with others, with those you love? Jesus says to even love our enemies. How's that going? What about total strangers who may be in need? Are there systems that need changing to help the poor and oppressed? How involved are we in making the kingdoms of this world more like the kingdom of heaven? If we considered the left side a starting point and the right side the most charitable, where would you plot yourself along that line? Since the time of John Wesley, Methodist ministers who have met the requirements for ordination have been asked a series of questions by the bishop before that bishop lays hands on them and tells them to take thou authority as a minister of the United Methodist Church. Some of the questions are, do you have faith in Christ? Have you studied the doctrines of the United Methodist Church? And after full examination, do you believe they're in harmony with the Holy Scriptures? There are 19 such questions, and if you want to get ordained, you have to say yes to every one of these questions, except for one that asks, are you in debt so as to embarrass your work? That answer should be no. But there's one question that often befuddles those who are about to be ordained, and it goes like this. Are you going on to perfection? 
Hmm. Good question. Am I going on to perfection? Perfection. Feels like I got a long way to go. Now, I know I'm supposed to say yes, but it feels a little weird saying that. I learned recently that if someone says no, then the bishop is supposed to say, if you're not going on to perfection, then where are you going? Good question. Actually, I don't know if that story is true or if it's just a Methodist legend that gets told at places like annual conference, but I like it. If you're not trying to make yourself a better person, then, well, what are you doing? What about you? If this cross was a graph of your relationship with God and with others, where would you be? Where do you want to be? Are your acts of piety strong, but your acts of charity weak? Or vice versa? Are you very charitable, but need to spend more time with God and His Word? Do you have a good balance? Are you struggling in both areas? For the sake of this exercise, I think we are all being called to live in the upper right-hand quadrant. But what about you? Where would you plot yourself on the graph? Where would you plot our church? Do you have gifts to share with others that will help us all become more pious or more charitable? Are there things you could learn from the church that will help you along your journey? Jesus made it pretty plain when he was asked what the greatest commandment was in the scriptures. He said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. You see, it takes both parts, for us as individuals and for us as a church. May we nurture both wings to keep us soaring. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have called us to be in relationship with you. And to be in love with you also means sharing that love with others. Not just in word, but also in deed. Lord, help us to proclaim the gospel and to live the gospel by doing the gospel. Help us to be more like Jesus. We ask this in his most holy name. Amen. Piety and charity. Our relationship with God and our relationship with each other. We need both parts in order to have a balanced approach, in order to fully embrace the entirety of the gospel. So I invite you, as you have plotted your spot on the graph along the cross, where are you? Where might you be able to share your gifts and where do you need to maybe bulk up a little more and strengthen some areas that maybe you haven't been working on in the past? I know God will be with you, and God will bless you on this journey. So go in peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.